I want you to go to Genesis chapter 37, and I want to begin with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you today for your word. I pray, Lord, that it will be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Lord, let us hide your word in our heart that we will not sin against you. Lord, as you said in Psalm 19, God, that your word is healing and strength and your laws are statutes and it gives fortitude in our life. God, and, and as you said in Psalm 19, Lord, you said that, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And there is not a place in this universe where your glory is not being proclaimed and the words of your glory are not being spoken. So I pray, Lord, today that your word will go forth and it will change our hearts and penetrate our hearts. And we will stand stronger because we have tuned ourselves to your word. And we give you praise for it in Christ's name. And everybody said... Amen. I want to read a few verses of Scripture out of Genesis chapter 37. And uh, Pastor Joe just uh, looked over at me and said that his favorite verse in the Bible is Genesis 39, 39 and 6, which says that Joseph was a handsome and well-built young man. I can see why that's his favorite verse in the Bible. I said, you need to start putting that at the bottom of all your emails, Pastor Joe. <laughs> Well, since Brian is not in the Bible, I have to choose a different verse. So, Let's look at Genesis chapter 37. I want to read verse 3 uh, through verse 5 and then skip down to verse 9 because it deals with the part of Joseph's life that was about his dreams and the, the time frame that he had to wait to see those dreams fulfilled. Today I want to speak on the subject of divine dreams, and we're still in the book of Genesis so I'm going to add this as, a, as Genesis uh, lesson number four. Let's look at verse three, Genesis 37 and three. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. Even he made him a tunic of many colors. And when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peace, peaceably to him. Have you ever had that happen to you? Someone was talking to you, but not peaceably. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Let's go down to verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they said, Look, and he or, and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Now, we're going to stop there. But there's a lot more to this story than just the two dreams that Joseph had. What I want you to understand about Joseph is that he did have a dream that was in his heart that God was going to fulfill even though that that dream did not come to pass instantly. It did not come to pass when he thought it would come to pass, but it still was a part of God's divine plan on his life. There are some of you this morning that have dreams in your life that you've been waiting on. Things that you are trusting God for, I have them in my life. Things that God has spoken over my life, dreams that, are, that have incubated in my soul, and I'm, I'm waiting on them to come to pass, and I'm still believing for them to come to pass. And it's kind of like an emotional roller coaster when you're waiting on something like that. It's like you, you get hopeful and then it's dashed. And then you get hopeful and then it's dashed. And you hope again and then, and then you know, time goes on and it, it's like it, doesn't, it looks like it's not going to happen. But there were several indicators about Joseph's life that let us know that he was working or he was working or living his life toward the dream that I want to point out to you. Because I really believe that, that these same things are applicable in your life and in my life. And if you have something that you're still waiting on, something that God has promised, something that you believe that the Lord has put inside of you, even though you've waited to see this come to pass, I believe there's some in indicators that can encourage you today and let you know that you're still on the right track. The first thing I want to point out about Joseph, and we're going to kind of tell his story as we go along this morning, but the first thing I want to point out about Joseph is that it was very evident that Joseph had the favor of God on his life. That's the first thing I want you to understand. That even though your dreams may not come to pass, there will be indicators that God really likes you. 
There will be indicators that good things are coming into your life and happening in your life to keep you encouraged while you're on the journey to fulfill the destiny that God's called you to or the dream that God has called you to. See, favor is kind of a strange thing. First of all, why Joseph? Why is Joseph the one that got the favor? Why not Reuben? Why not Simeon? Why not the older brothers? Why one of the younger brothers who's not even the, the youngest brother of, of this particular group? Joseph is way out of line uh, as far as being lined up in the right position to be blessed. He is not going to receive a great inheritance. He is not in line to, to have anything unique and special happen to him as far as money. He is, he is not in the right place at the right time or the right position at the right time. But somehow, Joseph gets the eye of God on his life and favor begins to happen in his life. Now, here's some things you need to understand about favor. First of all, favor has nothing to do with your giftedness. It has nothing to do with your talent. It has nothing to do with fairness. It has nothing to do with anything that you have earned in your life. It has nothing to do with your degrees, your personal credentials. God does not give you favor because you deserve it. God does not give you favor because you're super talented and you developed your talents. God does not give you favor simply because you've worked hard for Him and you think that you deserve favor. Sometimes when we go to the Lord and we ask Him for things, but Lord, look what I did for you. I did this for you and I did this for you and I did this for you. And that is not why you get the favor of God on your life. Well, what is going to fulfill the dreams of, of Joseph is the fact that he has the favor of God. But how did he get it? What made him stand out like anyone else in his life to earn or get the favor of God? You, you, when you read the Bible, you're going to see phrases all through the Bible that says that people received the favor of God. Now, if you look at all the people who received the favor of God, some of them had great sins in their life, so that's not how they got it. Some of them came from wonderful families. Well, maybe that's it. Yeah, but some of them came from horrible families, so that's not it. Some of them came from wealth, but some of them came from poverty. Some of them came from righteous places. Some of them came from wicked places. So that's not how you get the favor of God in your life. You can't just always do the right thing and show up at the right time. That's not how you get the favor of God on your life. But Joseph had the favor of God. Now, the favor of God makes no sense most of the time. It's like, why them? Why are they highly favored? I, I shake a lot of people's hands and say, how are you doing? I'm highly favored from the Most High God. And I, and I th think to myself, well, that's great. I know we're blessed, but man, I hope I am highly favored of God. But can I tell you something about favor? It's not fair. It, it doesn't make sense. Favor is unusual because of how it happens and why it happens. But it was without a doubt the favor of God that changed the whole life and the whole game of Joseph's life. You see, favor happens when God takes notice of someone and just can't seem to take his eye off of them. Now, we do the very same thing with people all the time. But it's almost like God fixes his gaze upon them and even the details of their life. Where God is just staring. It's like something is so unique and unusual about that person that God just, you know, he's, he's managing the universe. But all of a sudden he just, he sees this unusual child. And he just notices this unusual child. And as he stares at them or as he looks upon them, the fact that he is looking upon them automatically brings favor upon them. I mean, have you seen, you know how mama can change a room with a look, right? I mean, she doesn't have to say a word. She can just look, change the whole room. She can look and make everybody sit down. She can look and make everybody stand up. I mean, it's according to how she raises her eyebrows. How many of you know mama can change a room with a look? Daddy can do the same thing, but not nearly as good as mama can do. Well, the truth is that God can change your room with a look. The fact that he sees something about you that catches his eye, something that he cannot take his eye off of, 
what seems like a split second in heaven of God gazing upon you may feel like a lifetime on earth of God gazing upon you simply because God sees something so unique and unusual about you that he happened to take notice of your life. Now, now you, you say, okay, Pastor, can you prove this? Well, let me just tell you who God looks at because the Bible is very clear about that. There are people that catch God's eye, and when they catch God's eye, it brings an unusual favor into their life. One of my verses that I lean upon is Isaiah 66. It's a verse I've claimed over Twin Rivers for years, verse 2, that says, Upon him will I look. The one who has a broken and a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Now, now that does not mean that everybody who reads the word of God is, yeah, you are going to get blessed. This past week we read the word of God out loud. That's going to put blessing in your, body, in your life. The Bible says anybody that ever reads the book of Revelation is going to be blessed. It says if you read the words of Revelation, it brings an automatic blessing into your life just from reading it. So, I mean, you don't have to do anything else but just read the revelation and it brings blessing upon your life for just, for just reading those words. I mean, the Bible says that. But he says that if somebody gets in the Word of God and lets the Word of God begin to deal with them and it breaks them before God and it humbles them before God and it makes a servant-hearted person out of them before the Lord, that God turns around and notices that person, that the word has taken root, that the word has sunk in, that the word has become a sword in their hand, that the word has become bread in their belly. The Bible says that God will notice someone who is devouring his word to the point that it causes them to, to be broken that it causes them to be contrite or kneel before God or it brings them into his presence. There's a lot of people in the Bible who won the uncommon favor of the Lord. And, and on all for different reasons, Ruth won the favor of God. As a matter of fact, if you know the story of Ruth, Ruth is, um, is out there gleaning in the field because she's flat broke. Her husband has passed. Her father-in-law has passed. There is no way to pay the debt. They have a huge debt in their family, and the only way she and her mother-in-law can eat is for her to go out and, and to glean in the field of Boaz, a rich man. And because he caught her eye, he heard, the Bible says he heard how kind she was treating Naomi, her mother-in-law. And because he heard about her kindness, he told his servants, walk in front of her and drop handfuls on purpose. When she doesn't even know that you're there, just take a handful of grain. So here she is. She is out there picking up this little piece of grain. And then she comes up to a great big handful that has been dropped on purpose for her life. And he has just given her a whole day's wage. What it would have taken an entire day to earn she now has scooped up in her hand and she goes a little bit further and here's another handful on purpose and she goes home with a bag full of grain just like she was a working woman and Naomi says where did you get all of that grain we can eat for a month on that and she said I don't even know she said I didn't even see who did it all I know is I was gleaning in the field and there were great big handfuls of grain that would drop just for me on purpose. And she went to Boaz and she said, why have I found favor in your sight? I'm not even a Hebrew woman. She said, I, I'm an Amorite. I'm not even a Hebrew woman. And how, how in the world did I find favor in your sight? And he said, I heard about your kindness to your, grand, to your, to your mother-in-law. And because you were so kind, you caught my eye. And I said, I don't even know her name. But whoever she is, I believe that's the one over there. Just go drop handfuls on purpose. And you know what? All you got to do is catch the eye of so Someone who can give you favor. And by merely catching the eye, it brings favor into your life. Go ahead and give God praise this morning in his house. <laughs> Jacob's name was changed to Israel because he wrestled for his favor. He could have let go, but he decided not to let go. And after a while, the angel said, I'm going to bless you. I don't have to bless you, but I'm going to bless you because of your tenacity. You just kept 
on holding on to me until, and that just caught the eye of the Lord. And because of that, because of your faith, I'm going to bless you anyway. Daniel caught God's favor. A teenager caught God's favor. A teenager, but before he was 21 years old, became a governor. Think about it. He became a governor before he was 21 years of age because a teenager prayed three times a day in his window. And God said, I don't know any other teenagers coming before the window praying morning, noon, and night. I have not seen another teenager. I just can't take my eye off of him. It doesn't mean that he prayed the right prayer or the best prayer or the most noble prayer. As a matter of fact, the Bible doesn't even record the prayer. It just records the fact that Daniel prayed three times a day in his window and God could not help but notice it. And because the Lord noticed it, he's the one that saved. As a matter of fact, Daniel Daniel's the one that saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I know we talk about, you know, the fourth man in the fire obviously saved them ultimately, but it was Daniel who got them promoted in the kingdom to their positions of employment. So, so keep in mind that, that part of the reason that Joseph, we know that Joseph's dreams are going to come true, is because there are too many things happening in his life that shows that God's eye is on his life. I mean, Mary with the alabaster box. Look at everybody in the room. They're trying to send her out of the room. And Jesus just couldn't take his eye off of her. He said, I've never seen anything like this. She is, she is crying on my feet. She is wiping up my feet with her hair. And everybody else said, can you believe she's doing that? And Jesus said, can you believe she's doing that? I mean, what everyone else thought was indignant and tried to, and so uncommon, Jesus thought was uncommon. And because her worship was so uncommon, he could not take his eyes off of her. And because of that, Jesus said, leave her alone. When they forget who was in this room, they're going to be telling the story of the woman who worshiped before me. And this way, as long as somebody is preaching a sermon and here prophecy has been fulfilled again this morning in God's house, because Jesus said, as long as they preach, they're going to tell the story about the woman who had an uncommon worship that gained her the favor of God. So you don't know what God's looking at. All you know is that for somebody, it was caring for someone. For some, another person, it was prayer. For another person, it was worship. For Joseph, it seems that he has caught the eye of God because he is caring for his aged father. It appears that that is the thing that makes him stand out from among all of his other brothers is that he has a father who loves God, who is a man of promise, and that Joseph is bringing such honor to him and care for him that he has become the one who's taking care of this holy man. And because he is a holy man, he is Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You're gonna, you'll hear this story uh, you know, over and over and over in the Bible. But because he recognizes that the hand of God was on Abraham and Isaac and now Jacob, that Joseph, the next one in line, is the one who's caring for him because he recognizes the blessing of God on his life and he's caring for an older person who is a holy person and he realizes that. Favor is kind of like, um, for lack of a better illustration, let me give you a few illustrations that you see every day. Favor is kind of like a pretty girl who walks in a room and all the boys want to pull the chair out for her. And, and they don't know her name. They just know that they caught her eye. Ooh, hey, come here, let me help you. No, let me help you, let me help you. And they're all, or how about a dancing child? How about a, a little girl or a little boy who is listening to the beat and they got the groove on. And because they got the groove on, they are dancing around the room. And you can't, take, you can't, you can't uh, help but notice them. Even if they get in trouble, somebody will take up for them every time. Leave them alone. That was so cute. Just let them do what they're doing, especially if you're the papa. You know, you just leave them alone. L look how cute that was. It catches your eye. Or maybe the older gentleman who, who is stately and serving everyone. And you want to take care of him because he is so, he pays such attention to everyone else in taking care of them. Or maybe it's the, the military person in uniform 
I don't know about you, but if there's a person in uniform, I let them in front of me in lines. I, I buy their coffee. If we show up at Starbucks at the same time, I just feel like, you know, I want to give them an uncommon favor because of the service that they're giving to the country. So I always want to give them honor and I always want to give them favor. Notice this, that when the favor of God is in your life, it will point you toward the dreams of your life. Even if your biggest dream has not come to pass yet, the fact that God keeps opening doors, keeps dropping blessings on purpose, lets you know that you're walking in the right direction. I know a lot of people want money, but can I tell you something about favor? Favor is better than money. It's the truth. If you've got the favor of God, God can give you money from any source He wants to give you money. If you've got the favor of God, it will protect you. Psalm 6 and 12 says that it will protect you and be a shield around you with the favor of God. Proverbs 3 and 4 says that if you find favor with God, God can give you favor in the eyes of other people. That the fact that God's staring at you, God will say, Hey, have you, noticed, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered? Have you considered Greg and Kelly? Have you considered? Have you considered uh, Brittany and Jeff? H have you considered? Have you considered Joe and Kayla? Have you considered Drew and Megan? Have you considered them? I mean, they've caught my. Have you considered Kelly? Have you considered? Uh, have, have just look at them. There's something uncommon about them. God can drop your name in someone else's mind. God can take your resume and. Put it at the top of the list. God can cause someone to take your phone call when they thought they were taking somebody else's phone call. The favor of God can bring blessings in your life when nothing else can bring blessings to your life. It's better than money to have favor in your life. So the first thing we see about Joseph's life and his dreams coming true is that even though his brothers were against him and everything was against him, it is the favor of God that sustains him in the most difficult of times. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. The blessings of God often provoke jealousy in others. Now, you just got to handle that. If, if you can't handle the fact that everyone's not going to celebrate your blessing and that's going to tear you out of the frame, it might be best for you to never get blessed. Because the, the blessings of God are going to provoke the jealousies of other people who wish it was them. And, and you've got to understand, seldom does the jealous person ever get the blessing. You've got to get that part out of your spirit. You've got to pray that part out of your heart. Seldom does the jealous person ever get the, to be the one who, who catches the favor of the person who just can't who just can't seem to notice them. Notice what, what Joseph's father did to set him apart. The first thing he did is he stitched up a coat of many colors. Now, I, you know, we could just run right past that, but I want you to stop and take a look at that for a moment because look at this. He carefully stitched. He sewed it himself, which means that blessings sometimes take time. He chose the colors, and he put the colors together. He said, listen, I'm going to bless him with red, and I'm going to bless him with orange, and I'm going to bless him with green, and let's see how all of this is going to look together. I'm going to bless him with this color and purple, and I'm going to put all of this on him. And then when I put this coat on him, he can never blend again. When he walks out among everybody else in the world, they're going to see this coat on him and they're going to realize that he is special because he has the favor of the Father. And can I tell you something about your life? That when God begins to put blessing in your life, first of all, do not limit God to blessing you one way. It's a coat of many colors. You never know which color is going to catch the eye of somebody else. You never know how God's going to do it. So keep in mind, it wasn't a handful. It wasn't one blessing. If you got your eye on one blessing, you may miss all the other blessings that could add up to more than that, than that one blessing. So when you have the favor of God on your life and you're pursuing a dream in your heart, you've got the favor of God in your life, understand this, that the coat has many colors and you don't know which color is going to bless you. 
You don't know which blessing that God's going to give you first. There might be a small stripe and a wide stripe and a small stripe and a wide stripe. What if God says today I'm going to bless you this way and tomorrow I'm going to bless you this way. Then the next day I'm going to bless you this much and the next day I'm going to bless you this much. And before you know it you will realize that you are not your own but you have been bought with a price and everything about your life has been ordered by God and that even though you thought you were in charge of your own life it was actually God that was in charge of your life I've been ordering your steps with my word I've been bringing favor it's not by coincidence that this person noticed you it's not by coincidence but they're not your resource don't put all your resources in that person who noticed you no I'm the one that dropped your name in their heart and if I can drop your name in their heart I can drop your name in their heart I'm the one that put the code on you I want you to understand it's the father's blessing that is on your life and you can be blessed walking in a strange room where no one's ever seen you before you can be blessed because someone will take notice of you because you stand out in a crowd your coat will not let you blend your blessings will not let you blend wherever you end up whatever you end up doing someone is going to take notice of your gift or your talent or your smile or your kindness or your worship or something about you that's going to allow the favor of God to stay continually in your life. Give God praise this morning. So it's, it's not one blessing. But here's, the, here's the, the real test to wearing the coat of many colors. Because eventually his brothers get so upset about this coat, they rip it off of him and tear it up and pour blood all over it. Because they're so upset about this coat. So eventually that happens. But I want you to notice what happens before then. He continues to tend his father's sheep in the coat. Mm -hmm. You can let that sink in for just a second. He continues to serve the same way even though he's in favor. He continues to make sure that the thing that caught God's eye keeps God's eye. The thing that calls God to look at me, I don't want to just worship until I'm blessed and then stop worshiping. I don't want to just pray until I'm blessed and then stop praying. I don't want to just read my Bible until I'm blessed and stop reading my Bible. I don't want to just go to church as long as I'm being blessed and then stop going. I, I don't want to serve God a, until I'm blessed and then stop serving. No, the key to keeping my blessing is the fact that I can wear that coat among the sheep. I can still wear that coat shoveling what shepherds have to shovel. I can still wear that coat sleeping at night among the sheep. So the thing that caught God's favor is the thing that keeps God favor. When Daniel caught God's eye for praying as a teenager, we see Daniel at 80 years old being thrown into a lion's den. He still has the favor of King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel is thrown in the lion's den because at 80 years old, he is still praying like he prayed when he was a teenager. And can I tell you something about living your life? Don't just live your life to make everybody around you happy. Don't just live your life so that image will always so that your image will always fit expectation. No, you set your life to a set of principles and you can live the same principles out when you're a hundred as you started out living when you were ten. This world is going to change. Your relationships are going to change. The people in your lives are going to change. But you set yourself on a good course with God and you stick to that course. You stay that course and the favor of God can stay in your life all throughout your life even into your old age. Just because your circumstances change does not mean your favor has to change. Just because everything around you changes. So don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that favor and promotion is completion and self-achievement. It's not. Don't make the mistake of thinking because I'm favored of God and I got promoted, that, that means I'm, I have arrived. I have a theory. My theory is that the, when you think you have arrived... You have. That's my theory. As long as you think you haven't arrived, you haven't. But when you start thinking you have arrived, you have. That's the, that's the end. Your boat has hit port. 
and you've stopped. But as long as you keep expecting and dreaming and, and anticipating, there is always good things that are going to keep happening all throughout your life. Here's the thing you need to understand about favor. Favor does not guarantee every time that you're going to be protected from your enemies. But it does guarantee that regardless of the situation you're in, God's always going to give you favor. Now, I, that's why Hebrews 13 says, He himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do to me. I will not fear that, even though I realize that's a possibility and things will change. So I want you to look at David's life, or at Joseph's life real quick. Notice what happened to Joseph. He Get, he ends up from, the, from his father's care in the coat of many colors, thrown into a pit, pulled out of the pit, sold into slavery. Now he's in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife accuses him of something wrongfully. Now Potiphar throws him into prison, so he has gone from the pit to Potiphar's house to prison. And then he ends up in the palace. But can I tell you what happened when he was thrown in the pit? God sent by the caravan, and he got favor. Instead of getting killed, he got sold. That doesn't sound very blessed, but it was a blessing, believe me, compared to what it could have been. It was a blessing. And then when he got to Potiphar's house, do you know what? Even though he was in slavery, he became the ruler of Potiphar's house. Gee, that, that wasn't big enough. That would have been a big enough job for somebody to be the ruler of someone else's house. But the truth is, that wasn't God's assignment. So even though he was the ruler of his house, he ended up in prison after that. And it's like, okay, how could this get worse? But you know what? He became the ruler of the prison. The favor of God stayed on his life wherever he went. And even though he ended up in prison, he became the ruler of the prison. And it was the prison that caused him to meet the baker and the, and the cupbearer. And it was the cupbearer that told the king about the boy in prison who can interpret dreams. And guess what? He is now no longer at the bottom of the list in his father's house. He has now ruled Potiphar's house. He's now ruled the prison. Now he goes to Pharaoh, interprets his dream, and now he is the ruler of all of Egypt. Pharaoh said, I'm giving everything up to you except the throne. You can rule everything in the land. He became instantly wealthy. No, he's not fulfilling the place he thought he was going to be. But the favor of God has never left him. The favor of God was on him in prison. The favor of God was on him in a pit. The favor of God was on him in Potiphar's house. The favor of God was on him now in Pharaoh's house. Everywhere he goes, he just keeps getting promoted. Everywhere he goes, he just keeps getting blessed. You really can't keep a blessed person down very long. God's favor will keep showing up over and over and over in their life. So here's the next lesson we have to learn from David. Or I keep saying David. Joseph. David's life actually parallels a lot with this. But Joseph's life. Look at this. Third thing I want you to understand is that Sometimes setbacks are really divine setups. We don't like to talk about setbacks, but sometimes they're absolutely necessary for realignment. Sometimes if we continued on the course we were on, we would meet destruction even though it looked like a good course at the time. We would end up someplace out of favor or out of blessing simply because God wanted us to be realigned. So even though it looks like Joseph is being jerked around a lot, moved from one place to another, he is still fulfilling the divine dream that God gave him because God has to continue to realign his life. So just because you get demoted doesn't mean you lost your favor. So anybody out here this morning that lost a job or lost a house, that does not mean you lost the favor of God in your life. That does not mean that God is not getting ready to realign you in a way that you're going to be more blessed than you were before. Even though today it feels like a loss, it may be a gain before the week ends because God may be realigning you for more favor in your life there is a person in this room that hasn't gone through a demotion at some point in time of your life and, and and at that time it just felt like it was a loss but sometimes those setbacks are really setups 
Because the fact still remains that there would have been no miracle at the Red Sea if they had not have been trapped at the Red Sea. Uh, the truth remains that, that if there had not have been a Red Sea crossing, there would have been no drowning of Pharaoh's army. The, the fact remains that if there had never been a hungry mob, there would have never been the feeding of the 5,000 and the breaking of the loaves and the fishes. The fact remains that you have to have a death before you can have a resurrection. That you have to have a cross before the crown. You have to have a battle before you can even have a victory. That sometimes there is destruction before there is reconstruction. And sometimes there is chaos before you can get creative. Yes, sometimes we get set back. But setbacks do not mean you have lost the favor of God. And setbacks do not mean that you still are not on the same divine path for the dream that God has put in your life. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Sometimes you have to have setbacks so that you ask the right questions. Questions like, silver and gold have I none, but what do I have? Because that's all I need in this moment. Maybe sometimes you have to ask the right questions like, um, well, what do you have in your hand? Well, Lord, all I have is a staff. Okay, then give me the staff. I'll part water with it. I will give ten plagues over Egypt with it. Wave it over the Nile River. If all you have is a staff, give me what is in your hand, Moses, and I'll do whatever, you, whatever I need to do with whatever you give me. Maybe sometimes it causes us to ask the questions like, um, well, what do you have in your house? Well, all I have is a cruise of oil and some empty vessels. Well, then that, that's all I need. Then give me the cruise of oil and the empty vessels if that's all you have. Sometimes you have to quit asking the wrong questions and start asking the faith questions, which is, what have I given you? What have I provided for you? What is around you? What blessings are around you? Have you counted your blessings? I understand life's not fair. I understand life's full of setbacks, but life is also full of angels and setups and divine intervention. Life is also full of upper room experiences and the power of the Lord that goes before you. Life is also filled with faith moments where in the midst of chaos, God comes in and gets to create something that's never been created for just because you are in need and He needs to bless you with it. So if you've got favor in your life, your dreams can come true. Change of circumstances, never mind. Setups, not setbacks. Here's the final question. Is, am I in the place of God's purpose? Because when you look at his story, in Genesis 45, listen to what Joseph says to his brothers. Joseph says to his brothers who are afraid of him. Now the story continues to the place that his brothers are now in famine. He is the he is the leader of all of Egypt, and they come to him for grain in the midst of a famine. Now his dream is going to come true. The 11 stars bow before him, his brothers. Now his dream is going to come true. Everything he dreamed about is about to happen, and they had no idea that it was happening. Everything that God said, the stalks of grain, the bowing down before him, now they're doing it. And his brothers come before him, and when they realize it's him, they're absolutely terrified. Listen to what he says. Don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me. For God sent me before you to preserve our lives. Uh, sometimes God has to get you out before he can get anybody else out. Sometimes God has to send you out of chaos so that you can rescue everyone else that's in chaos. Sometimes you can't, you can't help anybody till you get out first, till you get your mind free first. And Joseph recognized we're all in the blessing of God. This is the Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob blessing. But God had to send me on ahead so I could bless the rest of the family in this moment. Moses had to be rescued to go back in and rescue the children of Israel. He had to be sent out first and, and his mind changed, his heart changed. He went away for 40 years 
But he comes back and rescues the children of Israel. Even Paul, whenever he was in the Philippian jail, he says, I know I'm in jail, but I'm not here because I deserve to be in jail. I'm here because God is about to set every jailer in this house free. And when he began to sing, the Bible says, not only did the miracle happen for him, but when the Philippian jailer showed up, every single prisoner's stocks had fallen off of them, and they were all singing and glorifying God and the jailer and his family got saved and went down and got baptized all because a man of God was in a precarious bind in a bad situation but God sent him in to bring them out hallelujah hallelujah sometimes we have to stop and realize that our setbacks are just setups so here's how the story ends he says in Genesis 50 but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I am in the place of God. It's actually a question. Do you believe that I'm in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children and be rest assured that he spoke, and then he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. He says, what Satan meant for harm, God turned around for good. What looked like the worst thing that was going to happen to me turned out to be the best thing because you just can't be favor. All I have to do is get God's attention. Whether he sees me giving or serving or worshiping or reading or praying, it's never, I can't ever tell which one is going to get God's attention. But I know this, if he starts staring at me, good things are going to start coming my way. If God fixes his gaze upon my life, then blessings are going to come right and left. So what can I do? Well, I will do what Jacob did. I'll wrestle my angels. Angels. I'll wrestle whatever I have to wrestle until God takes notice. I will become the best prayer warrior I can be, the best worshiper I can be. I'll be the best reader I can be. I don't know which color will catch his eye. I don't know which moment will catch his eye. But if I serve the Lord with gladness, if I come before his presence with singing, if I know that he is the Lord, he is God, it's he that has made me and not me myself. I am his sheep and the the sheep of his pasture. So I'll just enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'll enter his courts with praise. I'll be thankful unto him and bless his name. And if God just winks at me for a moment, good things will come to me for a lifetime. Can you give God praise in his house today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.